Hello, everyone, and welcome to First Fridays, a webinar series about the business of being a spiritual writer. These informal conversations take place on the first Friday every month. Today, our guest is our good friend, Aaron Healy. Aaron is a novelist and an award-winning fiction editor for numerous best-selling authors. She's the owner of WordWrite Editorial Services and brings 25 years of experience to her editorial philosophy, which at its heart is about empowering stories to bridge the gap between authors and readers. Her books include such thrilling stories as Stranger Things, Motherless, and with Ted Decker, Kiss and Burn. She lives with her family in Colorado. Erin served as a featured speaker at several Writing for Your Life conferences, and she's part of the Writing for Your Life Writer Services team. Welcome, Erin. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. It's wonderful to have you here with us today. Um, I've described some of your previous work. Can you tell us a little bit about what kind of projects that you're currently working on? Right now, I'm not actively writing. I did 10 novels, kind of my well ran dry, and for the last couple of years, I've just been back to focusing solely on editing, uh, editing and coaching. I'm doing a lot more coaching than I was, which is like editing. There's a lot of overlap, but I spend more one-on-one -on -one time with writers for longer periods of time, and I enjoy that a lot. So right now, it's just cracking the whip on learning writing skills through editing. It's, it's great how much you can, it goes both ways. So kind of what you're talking about is freelance editing, right? So yes, I mean, yes, know, within, so, right. Yeah, I've been freelancing since, uh, uh, since 2002. Um, and I, you know, take contracts from publishers for, uh, to develop their novels and memoirs, mostly. That's the primary aspect of what I work on. Um, but then I also um, um, take contracts from individuals, independent persons who have not, uh, not completed their novels, not found an agent yet. Um, and I do about 50-50 with the traditional publishers and with solo writers who are just finding their way. So I know when I first, you know, started learning <clears throat> about this whole industry, which was not very long ago, um, I didn't really understand all the different types of editing. Yeah. So could you kind of just give folks an overview of that? Sure. A lot of times when you say, oh, I'm an editor, people think you mean, you know, you're a copy editor or a proofreader, which is really important part of the process. Usually when it comes to books, there are four different kinds of editing. Uh, the top tier uh, or the first stage, I would say, is um, developmental editing. Sometimes it's called substantive editing. Sometimes it's called macro editing. Um, there isn't you know, a universal term for it. But that focuses on actually developing the content of your story or your book, working on the organization, talking about your target audience and how best to meet them. Um, so it's really big picture, 30,000 foot view editing uh, that focuses on craft and development. The second uh, step down from that is, um, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't talk about it in terms of hierarchy. It's not that one's more important than another. They're just more different. Uh, so the second stage is line editing, which is kind of the hands-on extension of developmental editing. You might still be working on really big picture elements of your book, but the editor will get a little bit more into the material, um, actually do physical editing of the book, helping you write transitions, write, um, suggest better ways of saying things, identifying gaps uh, in, the, in the material. Then uh, the third step is copy editing where a, an editor will come and bring that manuscript into conformity with usually with the Chicago Manual of Style, which is the industry standard in terms of um, bringing internal consistency to a manuscript. Um, oftentimes that manual of style is used in conjunction with a publisher's in-house manual. They might have their own list of preferences for how to handle certain details. Like, you know, do you spell gray with an E or an A? Um, do you use numbers or do you use words when you're spelling, when you're writing things down? So consistency, style, grammar, a good copy editor will make things very clear. Make sure your sentence structure is um, easy to understand and is grammatically accurate so that you don't sound silly, um, like you don't know what you're talking about or how to say it. And then finally, proofreaders will come behind usually in the final stage 
after a book has been typeset and is ready to go to the printer, a, a proofreader will come in and make sure there's no spelling errors, all the periods and dots are in the right space, the page numbers are correct, the chapter numbers are in order, and, and that sort of thing. So it's just a, a progression from really big picture thinking to very specific details. But those are the four major types. Well, that's very helpful. I, I didn't even understand it myself at that level of detail, so thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> um, so, and I'll just clarify, too, that's pretty typical to the book industry, other publications, film industry, you know, they, they all have different types of, of editing, but that's pretty clear for books. Sure, sure. So without asking you to, like, disclose any of your own prices or anything like that, what do those different types mm -hmm. of editing typically cost? Yeah, it's, it varies. It does vary widely depending on your skill level, the editor's skill level and demand, how long they've been doing the work. Um, it depends on how long your book is. It depends on how much work you need, how much help you need. So you're going to see a huge variety um, in, in pricing. Um, the very most expensive of those editing is the line editing, the second step, because it's just labor intensive for the editor. It takes a long time. So you're going to spend a lot of hours on that. Uh, developmental editing is usually the second most pricey. Copy editing and proofreading are more affordable. You could go to the Editorial Freelancers Association. Um, on their website, they have a rates page that itemizes really typical rates for freelancers in the industry and all the different types of editing and writing that's typically hired. So you can go there and get a pretty good idea of what you might pay um, on an hourly level for you know, your length of manuscript. Again, it's a range and you'll see prices higher and lower and everything in between. Um, but yeah, generally the developmental and line editing is pretty expensive. You should expect to spend upwards of two to four thousand dollars to have those two types of editing done. And then the copy editing and proofreading for a, an average book will probably around, be around anywhere from five hundred to twelve hundred dollars. Just throwing out some general. Those, that, that's extremely helpful. Thank you, Erin. I mean, I, I think I'll go find that page that you were Oh, it's a great page. <laughs> and, you know, Very helpful either on the website or, you know, social media or something, because people yeah. need to see that. And I, I wasn't even aware that it was um, out, out there. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great reference. Um, it, it tells you about how, how many pages an hour the average editor works. Um, 250 words per page is the industry standard. So anytime you are looking at something that says, you know, pages per hour, 250 words per page is what you should use to calculate. Cool. So how should a writer think about which types of editing to yeah. invest in, when to invest in? Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, I know some people think, well, I don't need to do any of that because the publisher's going to take care of it for me, which, That's right. you know, is yeah. not necessarily the, the best <laughs> path to take. So can you talk a little right. bit about those trade-offs? Absolutely. It's really interesting because um, I get the question a lot and the answer is never the same. I don't really have a universal answer to that question. Um, I think the answer to the question of how much money should I invest in editing before I begin to sell my novel depends. And you need a lot of self-awareness as to your own strengths and weaknesses as a writer. If you are a novelist, and you know you're a really, really great storyteller, but maybe your writing isn't that great. Maybe you're, mechan you know, you're not a literary writer. Um, your mechanics might be a little bit sloppy. You could you know, pay for a copy editor to come bring that level of mechanics up a notch um, and give a really beautifully presented manuscript to an agent when you start to pitch it. That can be worth it. Um, I do like to say that, you know, agents and editors don't really care very much about the things that they can fix. If you don't know all the rules of grammar, if you don't know whether to punctuate with a semicolon or an em dash, don't even sweat that. Nobody, that's not going to determine whether your book gets published or not. 
what editors and uh, agents do care about are the things that they can't fix, that only you can bring to the table. So if you're writing a novel, um, I would highly recommend you invest some money in a good developmental editor before you begin to pitch it because the craft of story is so important and um, editing, I mean, fiction publishing today is so highly competitive. It is really hard to get a novel published traditionally. So for those reasons, a developmental editor could be really helpful to you. If you're writing nonfiction, um, it might be less important to have a developmental edit if you're already an expert in your field. Um, if this is the first time you've ever done it, a developmental editor can help you with um, organizing your material in a way that's very easy for a reader to digest it and will make your work more appealing to agents and editors. Um, I don't think, I mean, it just really depends on where your own strengths and weaknesses are. But I don't advise people to spend a lot of money copy editing and proofreading and, and making it sparkly before you've done the hard substantive work of making sure your material is really going to stand apart from the crowd. Because all the sparkle and shine doesn't really make that big of a difference. So in my own, you know, kind of experience coming into the industry as a, as a newbie, um, it seems to me that the whole developmental editing, which for me is more strategic, you know, than the rest of the um, elements that we've been discussing, is so important because um, a lot of folks, I find, don't have a, a sense of their target. Yeah. You know, what, what's their target? Who's their target audience? What's their right. key messaging? You know, what do they want to be known for? You know, kind of what's the niche that they want to occupy? This is yeah. fiction or nonfiction. Right. And it's so true. To the extent that, you know, a really good coach, you know, or development mental editor can help guide. And I'm, and I'm referring, obviously, to relatively new writers with all of this, people that are, you know, just getting started. But mm -hmm. that just seems like such an essential thing to I think it's really critical. You don't know what you don't know if you're new to the industry. To get the chance to work with somebody inside who does understand how the mechanics of the industry works can be very educational and helpful. Um, if you are going to go hire a freelancer for any anything, any level of editing, I would encourage you to, to look for editors who have had experience working on traditionally published novels. Um, and I, that's not to malign people who haven't. There are plenty of people with excellent editorial skills. But you will get some inside information um, regarding how the industry works that can be very useful to you, as you said, strategically. So um, the whole world of um, <clears throat> do-it-yourself publishing, uh, whatever name you want to that's apply great. to that, indie yeah. publishing, yeah. self-publishing, which has kind of been hijacked a little bit by some of these companies that will, you know, charge you thousands of dollars to publish. Yes, that's more what I would call hybrid publishing, right? Yes, but they call, a lot of times they call themselves self-publishing, which I think is a misnomer, but. They do, no, their publishing partners might be the more, most common, and it's, it's the most expensive way to publish a book. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, given all of that, I mean, doing it yourself, you know, I mean, literally yeah. taking your manuscript and your book cover design and uploading it to Amazon or whoever. Yes. Um, um, for that type of route, you know, which is becoming increasingly attractive. Absolutely. It's good enough. Well, yeah. you know, do you, do you think there are different standards that apply or not? You yes, know, there, there are different standards. I think one of the things that I have seen, especially um, in regard to, to the self-publishing, which is this wonderful, uh, wonderful avenue for authors who have fantastic things to say, important things to say, good stories, they're worthy books, who just aren't going to get their time with a traditional publisher. I am really glad it, it exists. And self-publishing no longer carries the stigma that it once had. Um, part of the reason that it no longer carries the stigma is because the authors who are doing well in self-publishing have taught themselves the business of self-publishing. And they apply themselves to learning what is required to do it excellently. So um, 
among those things are hiring people, not necessarily a hybrid publisher, although they can be a great place to go, but hiring people who do know. Hire a cover designer. I sure wouldn't dare hire my own or, or make my own because I, it would look terrible. I have no design skills. So um, hire people who can help you because they have the skills to do it. What is good enough? I would say what is good enough is something that looks like you did not do it in a rush. You were not fast. You took your time. Um, as far as editing goes, I would say at the very least have your manuscript copy edited and proofread. Because one of the you know, most embarrassing things, even for a traditional publisher, is to get out a book there with typos in it. Um, it just looks shoddy no matter how well written or, or something is. So you can make your work look like you have done your best effort simply by having, you know, that, that um, copy editing and proofreading cleanup, if you will. I said earlier, I want to clarify that that's not that important to acquisitions editors and agents because they will do all of that. It is important if you're self-publishing, and that is the, the part of you that you are presenting um, to the publishers. This is the quality of my work, not to publishers, to the public. This is the quality of my work, and I spent time on this. I really care about it. You do want to put your best foot forward. So copy editing and proofreading can make even a kind of ho-hum writer look really, really good. So one of the questions that came in from the audience has to do with uh, the tools that you use to, to do writing. So yeah. um, Scrivener is, is one. I'm yes. sure that there are others. Do you have yes. recommendations along those lines? And um, um, You know, Scrivener is my personal favorite when I'm writing novels. I just like the way it's organized. There's a little bit of a learning curve. I like the flexibility of it, and, and it suits me. I think whatever you do it needs to suit your creative process. So find a tool that supports the way you function. If you feel like, uh, I have to work in a certain way just to meet the, the function of this tool and it's awkward and uncomfortable and I don't really like it, it doesn't make me feel inspired and energized, then just abandon it. There's no perfect way to do that. Um, you know, my favorite tools are actually reference books. Um, that help me know what good, strong writing is. Um, one of my favorites is called Woe Is I. It's a little desk reference by Sandra uh, Patricia O'Connor. And uh, it's, a, it's a great, easy to read book about just simple questions. Should I use that or which? How do I know the difference? And, and Patricia has this, it's a funny, light, easy read. It's certainly not the Chicago Manual of Style, which I keep on my desk. It's a 900-page doorstop. Um, I don't think you need to go that far. But find the tools that help you do your best work. Um, what's another one besides the Strunk and White's book, Elements of Style, is still relevant today. Still, if you've never read that book, read it. It'll improve your writing the first time through. Um, and there's just no end to the number of resources that are available. But those are two of my favorites that I refer that in a good online dictionary. I, you know, pay $30, $30 a year to Merriam-Webster online and have total access to their unabridged dictionary, their thesaurus and everything. It's fabulous. I use it all the time. I'm a terrible speller. <laughs> I'm probably the editor who's the worst speller in the world. So I I am too, and I'll I'll, I'll just type something. I've always got, always got my browser up, you know. Yeah. I'll just type a word the way that I think it should, that it might be spelled. Right. You know, into my browser and let Google tell me what whatever, whatever you know tell me what the yeah. proper spelling is. The one thing I would caution uh, authors against is relying on words grammar checker. Um, the, the grammar checker in Word has improved, but it's still a, pretty atrocious from an editor's point of view, and it will advise you to do things you really should not do. Um, so if you're committed to being a good writer, then, then be self-taught and go to um, some better authorities than what they've got at Microsoft. It's not that nobody knows what they're doing, but how do you convert it into a computer algorithm? The English language is a bit more complicated. Than that, so yeah, become a, a student of your own work. 
How about Grammarly? Is that a good resource? Uh, Grammarly, you know, I've never used Grammarly perfectly, but I, um, they have a free option, I'm pretty pretty sure. And um, I would say Grammarly is a better option than relying on Microsoft Word because Grammarly, that's what they do. That is specifically what they focus on doing. And uh, you're going to get better results from them, but I can't say firsthand that I've used it and, and like it or dislike it. I don't know what its strengths and weaknesses are. So in these webinars, we talk a lot about kind of business aspects, you know, of, of being a writer. And, um, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it, most writers that I know have income more than just what they give for book royalties. And obviously in your case, yeah. you, you do more editing now than you do actual authoring of your own books. Yeah. So just from a career standpoint, from a career advice standpoint for other mm -hmm. folks, can you talk a little bit about, doing editing and writing simultaneously, how that builds yeah. upon each other or? Yeah, well, I started as an editor. My, my career out of college, I was hired as, into an entry-level position at a magazine and started there. So I've always thought of myself as editor first, writer second, although I've you know, also been writing my whole life. They're pretty integrated. Um, when I'm writing, my own creative process requires just it's such a different part of my brain than the editing does that I don't do them at the same time. Um, I will write for a period of months exclusively and then edit exclusively. So I don't, except for the revision and editing process, I won't do that first draft while I'm also editing. It's a little bit uh, stressful for me. But the editing has definitely been my primary source of income. I think it's, it's just increasingly difficult for writers of any kind to make a living at writing today. Um, part of it is the proliferation of free information. Um, it's very hard to get paid even, you know, even if you're a good journalist and writer. The, the stories that are coming out about how little writers are paid is pretty abysmal. Um, and of course, publishers are becoming more competitive, so it's just difficult. I do think it's good, you know, to have another primary source of income. Uh, it's not impossible, but you just need to know that if that's your goal, that you have to treat your writing like a business. It's not a not a hobby, and you have to learn the ins and outs of the business. Um, yeah, it won't come to you. <laughs> so. Um in addition to writing and editing, I mean, I know you do some speaking, right? You know, that, that's another source of, of, yeah. of income for you. Are there other things that you get involved in? Um, for income that are income yeah. generating? Yeah. Um, the only other thing that I'm presently involved in is a course uh, called The Creative Way. It was started by Ted Decker. Ted and I have worked together for years and years. Um, and as part of that course, I usually have about 25 to 30 students a year that I, I walk through um, the opening pages of their novels. We work together on story craft one-on-one, -on -one, and again, that, that coaching um, aspect of the work where I'm doing a little bit more teaching story craft than I am, I'm doing it hands in hands with critiquing their work, but um, that's really fun. I do enjoy writers' conferences and teaching. Um, I don't get invited as often as I used to because I'm not in an acquisitions role. I'm not an agent. I'm not actively acquiring manuscripts for publication. And because that's the primary thrust of most writers' conferences is to bring in a staff that can do that for the people who are attending, I'm not going as often as I used to, but I do enjoy it. So um, since you're you know, you kind of, as you said, have a unique role within the industry that's not so much of, uh, you know, an author. Yeah. Um, you don't have to worry about platform as much as probably, you know, you used oh, to maybe. No, a platform for an author these days is critical and, and only more and more as the day goes on. I think um, writers are just more responsible than ever before for bringing their audiences along with them. Um, the the one advantage that traditional publishers still have over the independent market is that they generally have more connections and routes into stores, into the retail market. They can put your book in front of readers. But that question of how to find the reader, where is the reader for this book, 
um, publishers struggle with that question just as much as any other person, any other entity. Um, so your job as a writer more and more is to find those readers and bring them with you to the publishers, however you do that, if it's through social media or a blog or through speaking or your profession. Um, you almost can't get published anymore if you don't have that. Even literary writers almost have to have, and uh, literary fiction writers, which you, you think, oh, well, how can they you know, develop their own platform in their market. Well, they do it by moving within their own circles, their own writing circles, um, which are highly more academic uh, than, than most of us who are writing commercial fiction. Um, but everybody has to do it these days. It's, it's very, it's just the way that it is. It's the way that the industry has evolved. So you juggle quite a few different projects and, you know, things that are involved in different areas. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of your schedule and how you do that juggling? Well, I still have a child in elementary school. Um, so a lot of my work time revolves around, uh, around his day. And I do the bulk of my work, um, you know, starting after he leaves for school in the morning, I start about 730, uh, 7 or 730, and I'll work um, – until the early afternoon, that's when the bulk of my concentration is on the editing. Um, I'll get in a gym workout, they'll pick him up from school, we do our after school stuff, and then I work again in the evenings. Um, so that's, you know, kind of have a couple, this is a little more fragmented a work schedule than I like, but I do enjoy it. Um, I left Waterbrook Multnomah in 2002, and I tell you, it's hard to think about going back into an office somewhere. Um, I do like the independence of getting to work wherever, whenever. Uh, it's worked for us really well. Um, I might go back for health insurance. <laughs> but, but other than that, I find this freelance life very satisfying. And, and I would say, too, to, people, to writers are very well suited to becoming editors and to develop developing their own editorial skills. Um, I learned so much about writing just by getting to edit other people's work. If you're a part of a writer's group, the real benefit of being in that writer's group is getting to critique the work of other students, even more than having them critique yours. The fact that you're reading more broadly, you're seeing other works in process, you're discussing with other people how to develop your work in a meaningful way, that's, a, that's editorial work right there. And uh, the more you do it, the better you will become as a writer. Um, I do have, I'm working with a student right now, in fact, who has really, she has really sharp skills. Her mind's really wired for editing, and she's been starting to pick up um, editorial jobs here and there and is really loving it. So that can be a great way to both build your skills and um, get some extra income. So stepping back for a moment, what kind of advice would you give to people who are just, you know, getting started? As, as writers? Yes. Yeah, I would say um, the one piece of advice I'd give is to divide your time equally between the craft of writing and the business of writing. Um, I just think that if you focus exclusively on the craft of writing, you can become a better and better writer for sure. Um, but if your intention is to earn money for it, from it, you can't skip the business side. Um, it's, just, it's just essential. So to divide your time equally and prioritize it will have a higher payoff than only focusing on one or the other. Quite often, I think we find we get sucked into one or the other, usually because we have preferences. Um, I really am not well suited for the business side of writing. I, I need to hire somebody to help me with that because I just dread it so much. I'd rather be writing all the time, but I know I can't. It just doesn't work that way. So, um, yeah, divide your time equally. Hire some help if you need it. Um, that's worth the investment, but that's part of the business, part of the, the money you have to spend to make money, I guess. Good, good. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this has really been great. I, I know um, the wisdom that you bring, the experience that you bring is really valuable to new writers. And so thank you so much for sharing some of that with us today. Thank you for having me. It's always fun to be here with you.